Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Successfully navigating daylight savings time and the weather. <laughs> Credit awarded. Let's see. I think I saw an account. Is next week the first day of spring? The 20th. Is it next week or a week <laughs> after? 20th. It's not far away. It's within two weeks, anyways. Next week. It's next week, isn't it? The 20th. Well, Take a look at our. Yeah. Donaldson is here. Uh, loving memory of Betty Watts Warmoth again. Uh, yeah, next Joyce Sunday, and John and Judy Lutz have given uh, gifts to the church. Congregational meeting set the pastor's salary. That is March 27th, two weeks from today. And we'll just do that right after church, okay? And uh, should be short and sweet. Sunday school today after service food pantry let's see next week will be the last week okay, okay. we'll extend it one more week and so that will be next week church of the week is the outpost of merit church that's down below pittsburgh in western pennsylvania it's actually the old victory church and the Merritt Frank Church. Betty Osuski Senior of the Week. John and Kathy Wilson in New Guinea are the Missionaries of the Week. And does anybody have anyone else for our prayer list here today? We've got um, some of the usuals. Howard Young is uh, still in the hospital, difficult condition. Uh, John Gabert's home and doing pretty good. And so he's making progress on his multiple bypass. Anybody else you want added to the prayer list here today? Oh. <laughs> Lisa, is it yay or nay? Yeah. Okay. We have special music today from Lisa Reed. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else for the prayer list? Okay, glad to have you all here today. Let's turn in our hymnals to 6566, our name medley. <coughs> Let's all stand as we sing.
turn to the inside, right hand side of your page. And how about Barb, her daughter, and granddaughter? Read the first line. Women will read with you. And then we men will read the italicized lines and we'll do it antiphonally. Ladies, if you would. He who will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God and my trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He'll cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night. Nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes in the day. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but God will not know you to do. Thank you, you may be seated. <coughs> Let's bow our heads, we have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your patience and your mercy, your love, because Lord, we really need our hearts and minds to be reoriented to the kingdom of God. We are so attached to the things of this world and the visible and the system of this world and the values of this world. It is frankly miraculous that you break through and open our hearts and minds to the things of the kingdom. Surely it's a miracle that we're born again, and yet we are. And as everything else, it's a gift of God, and that none should boast. But let him who boasts boast in the great Lord, who calls and gives salvation to whosoever will, whether you understand it or not. Thank you so much, Father. We Please open our hearts and minds to see more deeply and powerfully into your kingdom. We've got friends and family here on the prayer list, and we just got through saying in a psalm that nothing should, we should fear nothing. We should be troubled by nothing. If we really understood what's going on in this world, we would know that there is absolutely nothing that can happen to us in this world that could ever harm us in any way, shape, or form unless you have ordained it for better things. And even death itself has become a porthole to eternity and your way of bringing us home to be with you. <coughs> destroying the power of evil, destroying the power of sin, turning it in and against itself, even as Jesus said, a kingdom divided against itself you have taken evil and wickedness, its very strong points, and evaporated, dissolved their power in Christ Jesus. A kingdom sheerly and utterly built on love. God, speak to our hearts about this. Call us to this higher ground that we might see more clearly than we ever have, and that we might continue to grow in grace. Our Heavenly Father, it's so easy to be self-assured and confident in whoever we are or whatever we are, or what progress we've made, but if we saw a glimpse of your glory, we would realize how desperately needy we are. Speak to us about these things. We pray today for our friends and family on the prayer list. There are names of people. Many of these names are unknown to uh, most of us here. And uh, yet they're friends of friends, and therefore they're important to us. So we put your he ask you to put your healing hand upon each and every one. Those who are to be restored to health here and now, or in, through the process of uh, surgery, or through doctor's attention, or the care of nurses, and those in rehab facilities, or just through time and, and patience, we ask you to put your healing hand upon each and every one. Those who, go through, who will go through many difficult days, months, hours, even years, 
We ask you for special grace. But more than anything else, Lord, we ask you to open our eyes to know that the hand of God is upon us to do the very best thing always and every time. Whether we realize it or not, whether it feels like it or not. And so our Father, we'll put our faith and trust in you. <coughs> we also pray this morning, Lord, <coughs> for these people in the Ukraine, and that's just been semi-publicized. But all over the world, there are people who are being oppressed and forced on. Not the phony oppression that we hear about so often of people just passing their insecurities off as oppression. I'm talking about people who have really been driven out of their homes. People who have really had their loved ones taken away by nothing more than some expansionist or border war. We ask you to bring comfort and peace to those who need it most. And bring clarity of thought and vision to all of us. We pray this morning, Lord, for that outpost church. And we pray that you'd open their hearts, their minds, their eyes, and let them see what great things you've done for them and truly be a lighthouse in that community. And again, Father, we, we're in the same boat. We need you to open our eyes. Once in a while, we get a glimpse of your glory and realize we need to do way better than we do. We pray for our friend Betty Olszewski. And we're so grateful she's able to be in a place where they take care of her and she's comfortable and gets the care she needs. We're so grateful for people like her who, <coughs> as they say, we stand on her shoulders. And they took this church from those who went before them and they have delivered it up to us. And our Heavenly Father, we pray that we might pass on <clears throat> to whosoever will a church where Jesus Christ is adored and worshipped and honored and where people grow in grace and where scales fall off eyes and lives are made new and people are born again. We pray today, Father, for John and Kathy Wilson and their missionary work in New Guinea. Put your hand upon them and continue to use them for your glory. We pray for the pillars of civilization, law enforcement agents, uh, rescue workers, first responders, military, and the brain trust. Our Heavenly Father, we ask you for help in so many ways. And we ask you for clarity of thought. And we ask for miraculous changes of heart. And we put these things all before you. And our Heavenly Father, we're quick to say that we need your help in every single way. But please hear all our prayers as we open our hearts and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Special music from Lisa Reeves.
Gospel of Luke. During those days, he, that is Jesus, went to the mountain to pray. He spent the night in prayer to God. Very important. He spent the night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and he chose twelve of them, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, who we also know as Levi, and Simon who was called the Zealot, and Judas son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Thank you so much, Lord, that you don't just give us a book full of ancient essays, histories, letters, gospels. We don't just get the book. 
but the Spirit of God, the Spirit that inspired these words, the Spirit that was involved in the creation of the heavens and the earth, the Spirit that has eternally been shared, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, unified, individual, eternal, fully consistent, fully one, and yet manifest in three ways. And that Holy Spirit, who is as much God as Jesus, who is as much God as the Father, that Holy Spirit dwells in our heart. The very Spirit, the very essence, the very name, the very nature, the very person of God dwells in us and is calling us to deeper and better things. Our Father, would you please come upon us and help us? We want to be deeper. We want to be better. We want to be We don't want to be smarter. We want to be more like you. Whatever that means, we ask you to speak to us. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the great things, I don't know how many of y'all listen to that Facebook thing at night. Um, I think there's a regular evening listening of about 25 people. Sometimes it goes up to 49, and uh, it depends on kind of the day of the week, I guess. But it has been a true blessing for me because night after night, I have to explain these different things. And there's no way to learn the Gospels. There's no way to learn the Bible. It, it, Sunday school teachers will tell you this. There's no better way to learn than to have to teach. Because then you have to start thinking about what these things mean, and you have to explain to other people in words that they're going to understand, concepts they're going to understand. He's talking about things that are eternal and invisible. Okay? If I have, want to describe a microphone to you, I've got, a, I've got one right here. We've got them all over the place. I could take it apart and tell you what the name of each piece is. and You've got it visually before you. But when you talk about the kingdom of God, you're talking about spiritual things that are no less real but they have to do what's in the heart. And the disciples came to Jesus one day and they said, Jesus, why do you speak in parables? Why don't you speak to us in really direct and plain words? Okay? Jesus was very reluctant. In fact, I don't think he ever said I who stand before you am God. He said, I and the Father are one. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But he doesn't give a direct capsule statement. I am God. Well, let's other people say it, such as the doubting Thomas, who we'll talk about in a minute. But the disciples came and said, Jesus, why do you talk that way? Why do you speak in these parables? Why don't you come out and tell us directly? And even when one time in the Gospel of John, he says, boy, we're so glad, Jesus. Now you're telling us directly what you want us to understand. You're speaking really clearly. And Jesus said, really? And you understand everything I'm telling you right now as clearly as it's being said. Because in just a few hours, they're going to be scattered. And in just a few hours, Peter's going to be denying him three times. And in just a few hours, in just a few days, they're going to see the resurrected Jesus, know that the tomb is empty, and still have confusion about what's going on. How do you understand the things of eternity coming down to earth? Okay? The human mind will never ever get you there. Logic and reason they are a part of the things of this world. They're a part of the functions of creation. Okay? They're not necessarily spiritual. But 
Jesus spoke in parables and he said, you know why I speak in parables? Because you have been given the gift of God to understand the secret of the kingdom of God. God has gotten through into your hearts and made you to understand that he is eternal, that he is the creator, that that death on a cross was not just the death of another one of maybe millions, but certainly thousands who were crucified through history. But the death of that Jesus Christ on the cross was transformative to any human being who's ever lived throughout all history. Whether they heard about him or not, that power is there and available to whosoever will. Okay? And unless, like Peter's in the boat one day, and Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And Pete, well, all the apostles joined in, and they said, well, some say you're one of the prophets. And some people think you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. And some people think, you know, a lot of different things. And Peter, John, uh, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus' words are, blessed art thou, Simon, the son of Jonah. Because you didn't get that from flesh and blood. Reasoning and logic didn't get you there. Okay? An instructor in a classroom didn't get you there. A chart, a graph didn't get you there. That was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. That's the only way to get there. That God should reveal to your heart who He is and who you are and how to properly see the world. That's the kingdom of God. And that's why unless a man's born again, he'll never ever see the kingdom of God. He'll see the kingdom as something that is a worldly replica at best. Jesus, why do you speak in parables? Here's why. Because you have been given the gift of understanding the secret of the kingdom. But those outside, <laughs> I've devised a device so that God is never ever scammed. Everybody gets a fair opportunity to enter the kingdom. But if you don't have a heart for the things of God, if you don't have that soil where the seed can take root and bring forth fruit, if you aren't truly repentant, I might as well be shooting. Remember those little yellow plastic BBs we had when we were kids? Shot out, out of a little plastic gun. You could shoot somebody in the side of the head and it really wouldn't hurt them. Unless it was my sister. She pretends she was hurt, but I know really <laughs> hurt. But you could shoot that BB against a half-inch plate of steel. Shoot as many of little BBs as you want, and you won't make a dent. And for those on the outside, the things of the kingdom of God, they don't make a dent. You either open your heart to God and receive the things of the kingdom, or you don't. You'll be hearing, but never understanding. Seeing, but never perceiving. And that's what Jesus was talking about. His whole life is a parable. He is parabolic. How is it? The wisest people on the planet Earth. This is, I just got through looking at this uh, Primus magazine. and You know, when somebody goes to speak at a prestigious place, they give a laundry list of their accomplishments and their, you know, he studied literature at Harvard and then he went to Stanford and studied mathematics and then he went to, you know, all the great universities of the world and all the education in the world. And it's striking that in those highest seats on the planet Earth, you find very little people really believe in Christianity as a transformative faith. They see it as a historic religion like any other religion. We'll just compare them all because this is just one of many. And who are the people who crucified Jesus? The people who really called for his death, the people who orchestrated it, they were the most educated people on the planet Earth at that time. 
What are you saying, Rev? You don't believe in education? I thank God I had the amount of education I had. And I never felt compelled to go, I mean, master's degrees and PhDs in the religious world, they're a dime a dozen. You go online and never enter the classroom and get them. And seminaries will say, hey, we want to build up our seminary, so anybody you can get to sign up here, we'll give them a master's degree if they'll just do 20 hours of study. Well, great, if you want to do that. I, that's just not for me. When Jesus went out to find his apostles, he spent the whole night in prayer. Now, I imagine when Jesus speaks in prayer to the Father, it's not a one-way conversation. A lot of times I think we pray to God and we tell God what we think, what we want, what we expect, and what he's to do, and we walk away. And there's not much talk back from God. We do all the talking. That's why you have such a hard time sometimes of finding his will, because we're stumbling through it and into it. Unless you feel like you're the only one, read these Gospels and see how the Apostles were. Okay? These people, <laughs> let's start the laundry list. God goes up, Jesus, who could be fully known as God, speaks to his Father all night in prayer. They commune back and forth. I imagine that's prayer like probably none of us have ever experienced. And he comes down and he calls his disciples, all those who follow him. And out of those, he chooses 12. And out of those 12, we have Simon, whom he named Peter. Simon, we already know he's a sinful man. He's the one who was fishing all night and caught nothing. And Jesus said, take your net and throw it out in the water. And Peter said, well, I've been fishing all night and caught nothing. But if you say so, I will. And he goes out and does it. And lo and behold, he catches so many fish that the net's splitting. He has to call for help. And when Peter looks at that, he doesn't look at it and say, this is a historic record count of fish. We need to count these all up and make sure we keep a record. This is unbelievable. Why, when we put Jesus on the charts, they'll see that he is the greatest of all because he... No, Peter's response was, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. That spoke to his heart. That spoke to his spirit. That didn't just speak to his intellect. That spoke to his soul. And he immediately realized, I'm in the presence of one that is holy, and I don't belong there. I don't fit in. He's spewing forth how sinful he is because of this experience of the fish. That's the power of the kingdom of God. Peter, you need to prepare yourself. Go to seminary. Go to Bible college. Get all the education you can. Get all the degrees you can so when you go and speak, Jesus didn't care about any of that. What he cared about was, do you have the goods or don't you? Can you show up and deliver? All that is great for what it is. For some people, it's very important. And the world needs highly educated people. Or we don't combat or have a chance against things like cancer. Or we don't have a chance uh, against all these things that impinge upon us. God's given us brain power and he expects us to use it properly. But the spirit, the kingdom, is a wholly other thing. That's why the most educated doctor on the planet Earth, who truly has studied more than anybody else, and truly knows more than anybody else, is in no higher status before God than the lowest, poorest man on the planet Earth, who is just a humble person who doesn't have the the uh, what the psycho the uh, mental gifts to be able to study? He doesn't have maybe the physical ability to be able to make a living for himself and his family. He's maybe what we would call soft in the head. But 
that man and that man both come into the kingdom of God the same way, by faith, and every last one of us in between. That ought to be the best news you ever heard. Because that means if God isn't excluding people because of the race, because of the religion, because of the supposed degree of oppression, because of their wealth, because of their poverty, he's not excluding anybody for any reason at all other than you refuse to repent. You refuse to humble yourself before the living God and realize what you have and who you are and your very existence is a gift from a God who doesn't owe you anything, but he simply loves you and wants everything for you. So he calls Simon, the sinful man, who he's going to end up calling the rock. He's going to say later on, you know that name, uh, Simon, that your parents gave you? It's a great name, historic Jewish name, one of the 12 tribes, okay, Simeon. But I think we ought to call you Rock because we're going to build something on you. You've got the testimony. You've got the spirit. You've got the heart. We can build on that. So I'm going to call you Rock. And that man he decided to call Rock in just a short period of time would deny him three times. And Jesus knew it from the start. But that didn't disqualify Peter. Because Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came looking for sinners. And that sinful person is you, me, and everybody else who ever walked this planet. Okay? Not just what? You choose your lowest of the low sinners. Repentance is available to whosoever will. There's no, <laughs> there's no benefit in being a sinner. Okay? Just being a sinner doesn't get you in the kingdom. It's wanting to repent from that sinful life that you recognize that gets you in the kingdom. There's no, Jesus is going to say, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. There is no inherent blessing in being poor, in this world or in the next. Sometimes poor people are very bitter, resentful, angry, and God himself, that they're poor and you're not. Your wealth should probably be taken away from you and given over some to them because it's not their fault that they're poor. And they're bitter at God and they're bitter at man. And from my perspective, they're not going to see the kingdom of God. Blessed, again, parable. Jesus spoke in parables. Parables force you to think. What is the virtue in being poor? The virtue in being poor would be that you realize that you do not have the things of this world and it seems like a shorter jump for you to know I, I, if God doesn't deliver, if God doesn't uphold me, if God doesn't provide for me, I'm lost. I have nothing. But the richest man on the planet Earth is in the same boat. Because he has to say, you know what? I read a parable one day about a sower of seed. A man who went out and sowed seed came from the lips of Jesus. And he said, you know what? Some people, they're like seed that gets sown among the thorns. And oh, they grow and it looks okay. But the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of wealth, the illusion. I got insurance. I've got health care. I've got the bank account. I've got the possessions to make sure that I get by in this world. And they say, I, whether they say it out now or whether they say it in their heart, I don't need to worry too much about God because I got it all wired. It's all I know. And so I'm going to carry myself on my own wealth and its illusion. Because the, God, the Apostle Paul wrote to those people, he says, Timothy, you tell the rich people of this world, 
not to trust those riches, but to trust the God who gave you those things to enjoy. He gave you those things to enjoy. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the wealth, the riches, the benefits that God has bestowed on you unless they become an end in themselves. He chose Peter out of all the people on the planet Earth. Andrew, Peter's brother. Peter was always the forefronter, forerunner. Peter's the guy who, when they see Jesus walking across the water, they're all scared to death. Oh no, there's a spirit, it's a ghost. What's going on here? And Jesus said, you know, hey, it's me. And then Peter says, well, Jesus, if it's really you, how about if I come out and walk on the water with you? Nobody else said that, but Peter did. The day of Pentecost, when they needed somebody to speak, the Spirit of God came upon all of them. But Peter stood up in front of everybody he had just renounced Jesus before and said, you guys are the ones who crucified him. You put him to death. And unless you repent, you're all lost. But he stood up and took the lead. He always seemed to have. Who do men say that I am? Peter pipes up, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter's got a brother, Andrew. Peter, he's the varsity football player who everybody knows and everybody loves. And his brother, he plays tennis. Nobody goes to the games. They just play. He chose Andrew. Andrew, I need you as much as I need Peter. Because there's a world full of people who we might call recessive, who we might call quiet people, who people who don't want to be noticed, don't really want to be seen. They'd like to blend into the background and let everybody else do all this stuff. They're content to just be there and live their life quietly. And Andrew, I need somebody who can speak to them, so I'm picking you. And he goes on down the line and he comes to Levi, the traitor, the backstabber, you know, the guy who is the Jewish guy who turns on his people and gathers their taxes and gives them to the Roman Empire, and all the people say, you know, we got tax collectors and sinners in our community. Yeah, the tax collectors, they're linked arm in arm with sinners. They're as low as you can get. And Jesus went to that tax collecting booth one day and said, hey, why don't you come and follow me? And that man left everything to follow Jesus because he was tired of the life he was living. And Jesus said, let's go to your house. And Levi said, you come to my house, but I'm inviting all my friends. I'm inviting all the tax collectors and sinners I can think of, and we're going to have a ball. I want them to meet you, Jesus. I want them to know what you've done for me, and I want them to know that you'll do the same thing for them. Because their families all hate them like they hated me and hate me. Their neighbors think that they're the lowest. You know the words. But I want them to know that there's a life. And you came to seek and to save those very people. That's why I'm picking you, Levi. James, the son of Alphaeus, the tax collector. And then he picks who? Simon, who's called the zealot. What, what is a zealot? You know what a zealot is? He's the one who won't take anything from anybody. He's the one who's, I'm not just mad about the price of gas. I'm ready to hit the streets. I'm armed and dangerous. We need to overthrow this thing. We need to act and we need to act now. And if anybody won't, you're a bunch of sissies and fairies and wimps and cowards. We need to get up in their face and take what's ours. That's the zealot. And Jesus said, you are one hothead, my friend. But I love you. And let me take you with all that enthusiasm and all that energy and let me steer it in a productive way because i got a world of people punctuated with zealots. And I'm picking you. Jesus, when he picked his apostles, it's just like his teaching in parables. Jesus didn't say, we better wait to 
come into this world, Father. I better wait till the electronic age hits, because then I can get a platform that the whole world can see me at once. I go on Facebook. I could go on YouTube. I could get an Instagram account. And I could get a whatever else they have. And I could be seen all over the world all at once. And the message that I got is so important. We needed to get all over the world. And when I come, when I get my apostles, Father, we, we need to get the cream of the crop. So I'm going to go down to Wall Street and we're going to get the guy with the most education and we'll get somebody from there. We'll go to the board of directors and find out who the muckety mucks and the higher ups and the most important people because we can really show their credentials. Jesus didn't do any of that. He came at a time to a backwater community, born and raised, born in Bethlehem, a farming community. The, the word Bethlehem means the house of bread because it was a farming community where they brought their grain, you know, they basically had a place where the farmers would bring together their grain and their products and sell them in that little village. And people who didn't actually live out in the farm could live there and go out to the farm and work and come back and sleep there. And they were close enough to do it. That's where he was born in a stable, in a manger. And he's raised in a town in Bethlehem, just, or excuse me, in Nazareth, just like our towns. Just little small backwater towns that you're not going to read about on the nightly news. Even the biggest things that happen in our towns that ever happen, they, they, they don't make it to the big papers. They're just, Jesus came to that kind of a situation. And he said, I'm choosing these 12 men of no distinction. Their only qualification, well, we could put down their fishermen for whatever that's worth. We could put down tax collector, but what I'd really rather put down is that these men repented, had a heart for God, were willing to leave the things of the world for the things of eternity. And they could speak to the hearts and souls of people who want the same thing. Because there's a world of people who are going to hear the gospel their whole life. And there are a world of people who will make a study of the Bible, their life's work, but they'll never ever know the God who's behind it. They'll never experience the kingdom of God because it's not about the things of this world. It's about the things of eternity. And then he's going to call the doubting Thomas and he's going to say, I've got a world of people who are the man from Missouri and they say, you show me, you prove it or I'm not going to believe. Thomas, I, I need people just like you. Because we got a world of people just like you. And they've heard the truth so much. And the truth has turned out to be a lie, or a fake, or a fraud, or empty, or so full of holes that they don't feel like they can believe in much of anything anymore. So Thomas, doubting Thomas, Welcome aboard. I want you. I have no idea what your credentials are. We don't know what these people's credentials are at all. Other than some were fishermen, and that some were uh, tax collectors, and those are their credentials. Nothing of this world of interest. And so he called them, and when he called them, he called Judas. He didn't say, when I. When I go to the cross, I'm going to leave it to some outsider to come in and just haul me away. No, I'm going to pick a man who I'm going to treat like everybody else. One of my twelve. And when I wash the feet of my apostles on the night of my betrayal, I will wash his feet too. And when he sits there with a bag and the other apostles said, I don't know when they realized it, but they found out he was stealing money out of the treasury. <clears throat> I'm not going to call him on it. You're not going to find any place in the gospel. Peter, Jesus sat across the table and looked Judas in the eye and said, where did you get that ring? Where did you get those fancy clothes? What's going on with you, Judas? Can you account for what's in that bag? One of the greatest episodes of Gunsmoke was 
when there was a uh, person who was impersonating Festus. Now, if you're familiar, is there anybody who doesn't know who Festus is? Raise your hand. Does everybody know who Festus is? If you don't, fill the kids in, right? You gotta know who Festus Hagen is. Well, somebody was impersonating Festus, and it, it, the, you had episodes called Alias Festus Hagen. The guy looked like Festus, and <clears throat> talked like him and everything, but he was a fraud, and he was stealing money. And when it came out that this fake Festus was stealing money, and the townspeople, of course, thought, it's Festus, and he's stealing money. And they go to Matt Dillon, the sheriff, and they said, Matt, Festus is stealing this money, or he's involved in this criminal activity. And Matt, he basically, like Andy Griffith when he was Sheriff Andy Taylor, he said, I've known Festus for a long time, and I never knew anybody who had less regard for the things of this world and the riches of this world than Festus Hagen. So we'll look at it, we're going to find out what's going on, but that ain't him. That's not his personality. Those are the kind of people Jesus calls from wherever you are. I think we'll leave it at that this morning. Father, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for calling people that are exactly like us out of this world to spread your message. When you walked the earth so long ago with not a single microphone available, not a single amplifier, unknown to men. The only amplification available was to stand in front of a rock or a building and have your voice bounce off of it. And there were no planes to fly you into a fancy venue to speak. No limousines, no trains. Jesus walked from village to village and talked face to face, person to person, and delivered the greatest message that ever is. Our Heavenly Father, deliver us from our reliance on the things of this world. Open our hearts and minds to understand what's really important, what's really powerful, what really makes a difference. It ain't the atom bomb. It's not the hydrogen bomb. It's the God who speaks things into being, who has invested himself fully in the person of Jesus Christ who has invested himself fully in the person of the Holy Spirit, who has been poured out upon all flesh, as many as the Lord our God should call to himself. Most of the world, many are called, but few are chosen. But those that are chosen, the Spirit of God, God himself, will dwell in your heart and transform you from the inside out and make you new. It's a growing process but it's the greatest thing in the world. It's what we were created for. Speak to us about this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn in our bulletin to 360, I mean our hymnal to 364. And let's stand as we sing.
Deliver us from relying on what we might think is our wealth. Deliver us from our rocking chair and call us to a life that only is by virtue of a relationship with Jesus Christ. An eternal life that is transformative, that's worth living, that overcomes the world, that has the promise of heaven itself and the very presence of God right here and now. Not tomorrow, not at death, not at the second coming, but right now, the Spirit of God, who is God himself, may dwell in our hearts, sheerly and utterly by faith. All we need to do is say, you know what? Lord, I, I don't even know what repentance is. I don't understand it. I can't explain it. All I know is uh, I don't have any life down here without you. And the Spirit of God will change you from within. It's the greatest thing of all. There's nothing else like it. There's nothing else but it. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.